everyone in life goes through challenges. Part of what we do in devotionals is that we get to a place where we understand that God never intended us to be unprepared. If anything, God wanted us to be prepared for those times of life when you're challenged by your circumstances. In other words, when the economy falls and suddenly you're left without a job, where do you turn to? What do you do? Do you suddenly lose what joy you had, what peace you might have had a comprehension of inside? Do you suddenly find yourself without faith for some reason? Because you see, there will always come times in your life when struggles to find your faith will grasp you and shake you and rearrange your life in such a way that God will bring you to a realization of himself because you'll have to turn to him. Because you'll turn to other people and they may give you good answers. You'll turn to other possibilities of being delivered and it may seem like a good idea at the time, but unless you turn to the Lord, you'll never really find what it is that God had in store in that circumstance. See, James says that we should count it all joy when we fall into diverse trials and tribulations knowing that the working of our faith produces patience. But then he says, but let patience have its perfect work, that the man of God might be fully equipped, prepared for every good work. So there are circumstances in your life that will come along that will challenge you right to the very core of your being, that will make you feel as though, oh my God, where is God? And you know, Jesus had the same experience. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane while he was praying was preparing for the time to come that he would be separated from his father. He asked God, knowing full well what was about to happen, if it was possible that these things that were going to come upon him would be able to be bypassed in some way, that if there was any other way that the situation or circumstances could be solved, that this cup of experience that he was going to go through, that perhaps he might not taste it this cup of sin that you and I filled for him. And when he was on the cross, he came to that place that we all do in life at some point in time. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he didn't say it just to fulfill some prophecy. It wasn't like he sat down and said, well, you know, I got to say this and I got to say that, you know, and I got to do this and I got to do that. No, as a matter of fact, he came to the end of himself. He came to the end of his humanity. The Son of Man died. And he tasted of death. And he tasted what you and I will experience in some way. But he also came to that place where he had an absence of the knowledge of the presence of the Son of God, of God his Father. The Son of God literally had become in some way that we have no concept and no idea to really fathom, but somehow God displaced himself of that unity, that oneness that Jesus always knew and experienced with his Father. Some people say that Jesus died of a broken heart, that his heart was so compressed by the outer sack of fluid that's wrapped around the heart that it actually burst from within. That could be true. I don't know. It only says that in the scriptures that when his side was pierced, when they pierced his side with the sword, that actually out came blood and water. So a lot of his, his physicians in the physiology of the crucifixion of the Son of Man like to detail all the aspects of what crucifixion accomplished or caused in Jesus to suffer for us. But the greatest thing that Jesus suffered was that same thing that we will go through and we have gone through and we may yet still go through in some way and that is to feel as though God has forsaken us. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like God left you? Now, he said he would never leave you nor forsake you but 
you could feel like he has. You might even think he did. You might even have some kind of false idea about God our Father that you would come to that conclusion that you would honestly believe that God has forsaken you. Well, in the scriptures we call that a horror of darkness when literally somehow God wants this circumstance to come upon us so that we would, once we pass through, trust Him and know Him in a more personal and intimate way. Today in Streams of the Desert, it discusses that. As a matter of fact, what it says with my handy clothes pin, <laughs> Lo, a horror of darkness fell upon him in Genesis 15:12. The sun at last went down, and the swift eastern night cast its heavy veil over the scene. Worn out with the mental conflict, the watchings and exertions of the day, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and in that sleep his soul was oppressed with a dense and dreadful darkness, such as almost stifled him and lay like a nightmare upon his heart. Do you understand something of the horror of the darkness? When some terrible sorrow which seems so hard to reconcile with perfect love crushes down upon the soul, wringing from it all its peaceful rest in the pitifulness of God, and launching it on the sea unlit by a ray of hope when unkindness and cruelty maltreat the trusting heart, till it begins to doubt whether there be a God overhead who can see and still permit. These know something of the horror of great darkness. In other words, when you've gone through and literally experienced that, you begin to appreciate what Abraham endured in his dream, a horror of great darkness, a time where you could see no light. For myself, it was a time when I was in the VA hospital dying. And I had no, I had my scriptures, I had my Bible, I had personal relationship with God, God would talk to me and I'd kind of miss him. But then there came a time where absolutely, from the moment I looked into this mirror that was uh, in the hallways at night, they become mirrors because the light's inside and there's dark outside so you can't see out. But I looked in the mirror and I saw in my eyes that joy had fled from my soul, that I no longer looked like that sparkle that was used to be always in my eye. And it was as though that moment a horror of darkness came upon me and I, I felt sudden despair. I wrote of it in my devotions at the time, my exposition of a human being, and I said, I felt as though faith had died and I had nothing left to believe in. God had fled the scene, and I was left alone, a man without his God. And in that moment, that's how I felt. I was so despondent, so empty. It felt as though life itself had terminated, and I was a, a golem, a soulless being that was walking through and going through the motions of suffering and dying, and literally with no hope and nothing but to exist in this meaningless existence that my life had become. And so for me, that was my horror of darkness. And that was one time. <laughs> I've gone through many. <laughs> but you may be going through one of those. And you know, it is thus that the human life is made up brightness and gloom, shadow and sun, long tracks of clouds succeeded by brilliant glints of light. And amid all, divine justice is working out its own schemes, affecting others equally with the individual soul, which seems the subject of such special discipline. Oh, you are filled with the horror of great darkness because of God's dealing with mankind. Learn to trust the infallible wisdom, which is co-assessory with immutable justice, and know that he who passed through the horror of darkness of Calvary with the cry of forsakenness is ready to bear you company through the valley of the shadow of death till you see the sun shining upon its further side. Let us, by our forerunner, send forward our anchor. Hope within the veil that parts us from the unseen, where it will grapple and ground and will not yield, but hold until the day dawns, and we follow it to the haven, guaranteed to us by God's immutable counsel. God will take you through. God will preserve you. But there comes a time, sometimes, when you will walk alone, without the fellowship of friends, without the knowledge or the 
feeling of the presence of the Son of God in you or the Holy Spirit as he has filled you and as he imbued you with his presence. You will literally feel as though you were completely forsaken because God wants to bring out from you something more precious than silver and gold. He wants to try you as if by fire so that you could minister to others. So that anyone else who goes through this horror of darkness would feel that you know what they're enduring. That you have gone there and you have been there. And you know what it feels like. The disciples thought that the angry sea separated them from Jesus. No. Some of them thought worse than that. They thought that the trouble that had come upon them was a sign that Jesus had forgotten all about them and did not care for them. Oh dear friend, that was when troubles have a sting, when the devil whispers, God has forgotten you, God has forsaken you. When your unbelieving heart cries as Gideon cried, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? The evil has come upon you to bring the Lord nearer to you. The evil has not come upon you to separate you from Jesus, but to make you cling to him more faithfully, more tenaciously, and even more simply. Because a lot of times we get all these ideas of how we think we should walk with God, talk with God, be with God. We get these rituals down. Well, we've got to make sure we get our devotional in the morning, you know, and sure enough, you know, I, I read it and I'm ready. Or we feel like we have to go through our prayer ritual where we don a tallies or we put on some kind of spiritual airs where we feel like we have to pray up, we have to read up. If we don't get our Bible reading in, oh my God, the world will fall apart. The reality is, is that when you go through a time of war or of darkness, God seems to separate you from all these support mechanisms, all these nice traditions that we've done and made part of our life. But now he just wants to take away those things so that you will depend upon him for your life. For all that we are and will always come down to one last thing that we will give up. And that is the rights to our life itself. Because in the end, we will die. So will we have given up the rights to our life now? Or will we give up our rights to eternity then? God will compress you. God will conform you. God will do all that he can to bring you to the place where you will make the decision to make Jesus not just the Savior, but Lord of your life.